She was like a film star. She had this wicked, really wicked persona. It's like any star, passers would say, point, he's Frida Stark, the notorious Frida Stark. She had this incredible charismatic power over both men and women. Frida Stark first came to public attention in the late 1930s as a performer extraordinaire. Intimate details of her life were to fill newspapers for decades to come. Reports of a glittering starlet that led a lifestyle that shocked and scandalised. A life of glamour, heartbreak, love, sex and suspicion of murder. Frida, right from a very early age, showed a lot of ability and she was very, very supple. She was what I suppose you'd call a contortionist. She could put her arms and legs everywhere and uh, she was a magnificent little acrobat. She had been a trapeze artist until she fell off. And she was a beautiful mover. She, she just talked about you know, poetry in motion when she moved. She just somehow, there was just something about the way she moved that, that people loved to see. Frida first hit headlines in the 1930s after she befriended the glamorous married couple Eric Mario, a sophisticated music conductor, and his beautiful young wife, Thelma Trott. In 1934, Frida's friendship with Thelma escalated into a passionate love affair. The trio carried on a life filled with drugs, alcohol, partying, and sex. It was to end tragically. On Monday the 15th of April, 1935, Thelma died from an overdose of a sleeping potion, and Eric Mario was arrested for the murder of his wife. Frida's role in the trial was that of being the star witness for the prosecution. It was her job to prove that Eric Mario had attempted to poison her and also had successfully poisoned and killed his wife. It was alleged that he poisoned her with a dose of Veronol in a glass of milk, which he took to her to drink. Mario then said something about that Frida and Thelma were lesbians and that was some sort of suicide pact. And it was all typical theatrical nonsense, but anyway. So then Frida said she was allergic to milk, so she didn't drink the milk, Thelma did, and then they got the idea that the poison was in the milk. A great section of the New Zealand public hated her because Mario had just announced in truth that his wife was a lesbian. And in those days, that was considered horrible. It is very romantic to think that your lover had been poisoned by a jealous husband and he attempted to poison you. The courts were convinced, a lot of people thought Frida was lying, thought that Thelma died naturally from an overdose of a painkiller or a substance because she had been ill at the time. At the same time, there was a large amount of people who defended Eric Mario. A lot of people still believe that he was innocent. People queued up to get a seat in the trial just to get a glimpse of the notorious Frida Stark, to hear all the juicy tidbits of gossip about the main arch of this artistic life, of the people that, that had parties, that slept together and thought nothing of it in a highly moral age where you didn't even hold hands in the street unless you were engaged, let alone be unchaperoned. The judge, the uh, Attorney General and the Minister of Justice all thought he was innocent. She had this amazing charismatic personality. Um, she just seemed to suck people in. And it's almost like she created a, some sort of illusion and two male juries and the police somehow danced to her tune. In May 1948, Eric Mario was released from Mount Eden Prison after serving 12 years of his life term. To this day, controversy still surrounds the trial. What actually happened on that fateful weekend in April 1935 will forever remain a mystery. It was the 1940s and Frida was back on her feet. 
She was hired to dance with the Lucky Lovelies. Life became hectic for the dance troupe, performing every night in the Civic's Winter Garden for crowds of American servicemen stationed in Auckland. The Civic had gone through a bit of a decline after its opening in 1929 and the Depression, and it was struggling like a lot of other businesses. The war years came, it had a very gifted manager at that time, Lawrence Quinn. The US Marines were using New Zealand, Auckland and Wellington specifically, as a rest and recreation venue. They were young, they were well paid, the famous line, they were overdressed, overpaid, oversexed and over here. And Lawrence Quinn realised that the Winter Garden Cabaret was becoming the headquarters for the Marines and he thought a cabaret troupe of dancers would be ideal to put on. So he engaged a woman called Regina Ray to form a group of dancers, choreograph them, costume them, and put on this cabaret dance show at night in the Winter Garden after the film had screened. The group was called the Lucky Lovelies and Frida Stark, who was great friends of Regina Ray and some of the other dancers, was also engaged to form part of this troupe. And then it suddenly thought, what say if Frida does a dance in the nude? But you had to be dressed. You weren't allowed to move about on the stage. So they painted Frida with gold paint and she did a magnificent statuesque dance as only she could. saw this young petite dancer coming out completely nude doing this dance to Defaya's ritual fire dance painted in gold paint. It was contrary to anything else anyone had imagined. It was notorious, sensational. The word spread like wildfire and Frida was nicknamed the fever of the fleet because here in front of them was a naked woman. Even the films of that time wouldn't show such a thing. The servicemen absolutely loved it. Well, you can imagine, because she was painted in gold. And of course, the, the American GI guys went mad. Frida would get an, an enormous ovation, of course. It was all rather impersonal untouchable, slow moving. Once the troops had gone, the war was over, the complete fizz went out of that vibrant artistic life that was here during the war. Even with the Civic, it fizzed out, the cabaret became just another place for dine and dance. I first met Frida at the end of a show which had been held in His Majesty's Theatre. She was sitting on that side of the room and I was over here. I couldn't keep my eyes off her. She appeared at this party looking like Hollywood move over. She wore a camel hair coat with an enormous red fox and I think I lay at her feet from that very moment. She wasn't beautiful in, in, in a classic sort of sense. She just had a, a lovely spirit. And I found that when I, my duty was finished and I was coming back to New Zealand, I wasn't coming back to my sisters or my father. I was coming back to see Frida Stark. Over the distance, I'd really fallen in love with her. Frida and Harold married in September 1947. Sex didn't form a large part of their marriage, but the marriage continued as a loving friendship. In 1973, Frida and Harold divorced, but remained close friends for the rest of their lives. Frida's later life was a very happy time because I don't believe she had any regrets. She enjoyed life, she had great friends, she was entertained, she went to shows. She was a very happy person because she was satisfied with her life, with what she had done. 
it was almost serendipitous that the Civic, as it had been from 1929 to 1999, closed at the same time that Frida closed and left us. So it was a fitting end of an era. It was the end of her era, and it was the end of the Civic's era, because when it opened again in 2000, it was no longer that Civic. Frida now rests with her beloved Thelma in West Auckland's Waikometi Cemetery. On her tombstone, there is a simple inscription that refers to Frida as Le Toile d'Or, the Golden Star.